Well, good evening. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Welcome to this evening's study, our continuation of the series of the Three Angels' Messages of Righteousness by Faith. We're reading Jones's uh, appeal, An Appeal for Evangelical Christianity. Uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the Sabbath uh, that's coming here and, of course, many other places in the world we know that the Sabbath is always a blessing to feel your presence near us and to fellowship with um, your children. Um, we truly uh, cherish this time that we have together. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can unite our hearts and minds as we review this document by A.T. Jones. Help us to understand its implications for us today. We just pray, Lord, that... Um, you can bless each person watching this video, that they can be drawn close to you. Be with us now through thy spirit is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so uh, I mean, we're reading A.T. Jones' presentation from 1909. I can't remember the date, May, May something or other, um, 1909, that he presented at the General Conference and this appeal for evangelical Christianity, as you, you've seen, Jones was not treated uh, very well by the General Conference Committee and, and by the church. And my view is that, you know, in some ways he's correct, in some ways he's not correct. It did affect his relationship with the church. And also, even though he believed in the spirit of prophecy, it, it did affect his relationship with Ellen White because of what had happened with the church. Now, some of the information that I've been told over the years about Ellen White's statements, I find actually have nothing to do with this 1909 presentation by Jones. So some documents that I read tried to attribute statements that Ellen White made 15 years earlier, uh, try to attribute those two statements that she made in 1909 regarding Jones in 1909. So, so far I have not been able to find her saying anything about his presentation. She does presentations at this general conference, but nothing that references anything that A.T. Jones has done. So it's something I'm, I'm still looking into to try to find some background information. Now, Jones had his credentials removed and he's discussed that. and and. And what he's doing is he's making an appeal and we need to consider what he's saying if it's, if he's correct about what he's saying, uh, in every aspect. And then we would have to say, how does this apply uh, to this movement at the present time? How do we, how do we take what Jones has said, his experience, and we're contrasting this to some, in some ways to Wagner's experience. So Wagner ends up rejecting Adventism, really. Uh, Jones never does, but he definitely is at odds with the church. And maybe his, him being at odds with the church is not that, uh, that he has done something wrong, but that the church has done something wrong. I don't know, right? At this point, uh, my view is that he takes it personally and, and gets emotionally involved with it. But, you know, I wasn't there. All I have is the documents that I've read and this one that we're going through now. So here he's going to um, lay out the evangelical order, what that is. And he also calls it the Christian and New Testament order. And he says, is Christ, the, the living present Christ, all and in all? The Christian and New Testament order is God in Christ, the builder of his church, not Moses, nor some men in the place of place and name of Moses. Now, if, if anybody's ever read um, E.T. Jones' book, Ecclesiastical, I think it's called Ecclesiastical Empire. I'm not sure. Let me see. Um, trying to think of the titles of his books. So it's not Ecclesiastical Empire. It's uh, Empires. There's Empires of Prophecy. These are basically textbooks that he wrote. Ecclesiastical Empire. Empires of the Bible. That's the one. And, and that's going to start from creation. It's going to go through the division of all the different um, 
people after the flood and where they went in the world and how they're connected to the different um, uh, ethnic groups that uh, and language groups that occur in the world. And he's going to talk a lot there about um, how these these rulers established this false theocratic theory. And, in, and so the idea is that, and, and then when we get to the time of Moses, God is going to set up a theocracy, but we are no longer under theocracy. So what, what you would have to have to have a theocracy is you would have to have God set it up and God um, instructing directly uh, the leaders of that theocracy, as he did with Moses. But one thing we know about the theocracy that God used under Moses is that it didn't survive, that that experiment, if you want to call it that, that demonstration, that if God was to reveal himself, you know what many atheists said, why doesn't God just reveal himself, show his power, and then we'll believe? Well, he did that, and it didn't work. Right? Man was still just as unbelieving as ever, because it's not about belief in the sense of knowing something by sight, right? Because that's not really true belief. Jesus says, blessed is he that believe, has not seen and yet believes, right? So to establish faith can't be established upon sight. It has to be established upon a relationship with God working in your life personally. And, and if that's the case, then you can see what, what Jones is going to present here about evangelical Christianity, is that this really is a connection to Christ on an individual level. So he says, the Christian and New Testament order is Christ himself in person, through and by the Holy Spirit, the head of every man personally and individually, not collectively, through a centralized hierarchy. It stands written in the New Testament as the statement of the New Testament order, that by one spirit, it is the same God which worketh all in all, that the manifestation of the spirit that um, is given to every man and given to every man to profit with all. Looks like there's some quotation marks kind of not making sense there. And all these gifts... Uh, manifestations and admonitions, all these worketh that one and the self same spirit dividing to every man severally, that means individually, personally, separately, as he will, as he will, not as some president or committee will. That is, as the builder of his own church, which is the body of Christ, God hath set the members, every one of them in the body, the church, as it hath pleased him, as it hath pleased him, not as it may please some committee or organized work, in, in quotation marks. The Christian and New Testament order is the order of the kingdom of God, where God in Christ, by the Holy Spirit, is the one king, the one Lord, and the one sovereign in and over each individual. The kingdom of God is within you. In and in and over the church of Christ, which is built together by God for an habitation of God through the spirit. The kingdom of heaven is as a man taking a far journey who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And to every man, according to his several individual, personal or separate ability. Now, I definitely agree with Jones. That is, I do believe that God can take care of his church as each member is connected to Christ. Now, if it's true that we are connected to Christ, we will cooperate with the, those that are connected with Christ, right? That, that is, an organization cannot connect people to Christ. It cannot make people that are not connected to Christ work together with Christ. Because if the individual is not converted, He's not going to be cooperating with Christ. He has to be connected to Christ. And so lots of times people try to get connected to Christ through a religion, through an organization, through a church. And they think that if they go to this church and they listen to what, what the pastor says or what the bishop says or the pope, then that connects them to Christ. But it's pretty clear in the Bible that each person as an individual can be connected to Christ, to the one head. 
But it doesn't mean that the individual then just goes and does whatever he wants, that he's independent of the other parts of the body of Christ. He isn't independent. Every part of the body of Christ is dependent upon every other part of the body of Christ. So I, I think that should be understandable. Now, you do get people who become very individually minded. I'm naturally very individually minded. I, I was at the swimming pool today, and and at the swimming pool, I'm, I'm usually in, in the deep end doing exercises. And there was some children there. There's a, a rope that can swing into the pool, and then there's this climbing climbing wall that they can climb and then jump into the water and things like that. And there was these uh, kids they're from the same family, I think. And they were doing stuff that they weren't supposed to do. And the lifeguard would come and talk to them. And they would talk back to the lifeguard. They, they definitely didn't listen. And then I saw the kids with their parents afterwards. And they talked back to their parents all the time. And, uh, you know, if we think about our natural heart, the natural heart needs to be tamed. That is, my natural heart is probably a lot more like those kids Definitely my, my, my children, especially my son James was, was not like that. He was extremely obedient. Bas- basically the best kid you could ever have. Maybe Diana was kind of similar, but, um, you know, I wasn't na- that way. I was probably a little more that I had to be tamed, but really my taming came when I became converted. That is, I was then able to cooperate with others where before I was much more independent minded. And I understood the necessity of a church, going to a church where people didn't necessarily think exactly as I thought or had the same opinions that I had. Um, But I could recognize that God was working in their lives and I could cooperate with them in what God was doing. And that's an extremely important aspect to have as a Christian. If, If you're the type of Christian who's always you're always right. And everybody should listen to you. Well, that's definitely not the spirit of Christ. A Christian needs to be meek and humble and teachable. needs to be patient and gentle and kind. And there's all kinds of characteristics that Christ has. And we need those characteristics. Now, when a person is Christ-like, often they may not get along with people who are unconverted. That is, they may, you know, go to a church and... And as much as they try to cooperate with what's happening there, those that are unconverted will war against them. They will they will think that that person's arrogant or they'll think, you know, because they don't submit to proper church authority uh, because they won't act or believe in certain ways that other people think they should. So we know that these conflicts occur and and we know that they that he that is of. The flesh persecutes him that is of the spirit. He's that that's, uh, you know, the child of the promise is persecuted by the child of. Um, of uh, well, and, and I'm trying to think what the word is there in the Bible, but talking about how Ishmael persecuted Isaac. It's in the Bible. I, I just can't remember the words. But but the point is that we still need to learn to cooperate with others. And everything we should do is to seek to be at peace with all men and to work with others and not consider that, you know, everyone else is wrong and you're right about everything. Because, you know, we have to recognize we're human beings. We're we're faulty. Our opinions, you know, sometimes in, in rebellion against unjust authority, we can be just as bad as the unjust authority that we rebel against. And I've seen it many times that rebels who rebel against unjust authority, when they get authority, they're more unjust than the authority that they rebelled against. And I believe that's something that we've seen in the movement, that the movement has treated us worse than the church had treated us. Okay, so going back on this organization, this Church of Christ is organized from him and by him through the Holy Spirit alone, according to this Christian and New Testament order, Whosoever belongs to Christ by personal faith is that very in that very thing belongs to the church of Christ, which is his body, the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. 
The unity of this church and of the members thereof is the divine unity of the spirit in the fellowship of the father and the son. Not an organization unity, nor a unity of association even. What is needed by Christians and churches everywhere is not human machinery, but the Holy Spirit in all that he is and in all that he is intended to be to the individual and to the church. And all that I'm asking or preaching anywhere in, is that the place of the Holy Spirit shall be recognized in the individual and in the church and that this place shall be given to him holy and absolutely. That is the Christian and New Testament order. And that is, in truth, antagonistic to the organized work of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. Cannot be denied so long as the organized work is confessedly and officially stated to be the Mosaic and Old Testament order. But so long as I believe in Christ instead of Moses and in the Christian order instead of the Mosaic order, and so long as the Seventh-day Adventist denomination holds to Moses and the Mosaic order, this antagonism cannot be prevented. Christ and the Christian order must stand. Christ and the Christian order must be preached. And Christ and the Christian order will prevail. Which will you have? That is now the question to this general conference and to every Seventh-day Adventist. So then he says he's going to go through some history here. He's going to go through what happened and how the New Testament order was refused. He says here in 1901, the denomination was brought to the very threshold of the Christian and New Testament order. But instead of going on through the open door fully into evangelical Christianity, in 1902, the whole order was reversed. And that it was reversed here is the sure evidence. In the report presented to this conference by your president in the section on organization, the impression is conveyed that what you have now he and here is the way of organization is the direct in the way of organization is the direct and consistent continuation of that which was begun in and by the general conference of 1901. But by his own words spoken in May 1902, an explanation of what had begun in 1901, anybody can see and know that such an impression is not correct. Now, just to give you a bit of background, because I read the 1901 General Conference Bulletin and, and what had gone on there. So basically, at the beginning of the General Conference, from what I remember, because I, I read this like 30 some years ago, they were kind of patting themselves on the back on how much the church had grown and all their missionary work and everything that was happening. Uh, around the world, um, and then Ellen White gets up and speaks and says that we need to reorganize, that that we are not really doing the work that needs to be done, um, that everything is coming from Battle Creek, it's being controlled at the top, and, and that's actually hindering the work. So basically, the organization, the church organizational structure, is getting in the way of the work of the Holy Spirit to work in the lives of the individual and everything's controlled by policy instead of principle and that um, individuals are not free to act uh, you know as they see fit in in the area of responsibility that's being given to them so that there's too much control so so jones is going to show how that they didn't actually listen to what ellen white said they're going to give lip service to it but they're not going to actually reorganize in the way that she had suggested. Uh, he goes on, it will not be necessary to enter into this extendedly. All that is needed is to cite just eight lines. For in these eight lines, he stated a principle that is the pivot of this whole matter, and that itself tells the whole story of then and now. As printed in the bulletin of the European Union Conference held in London, England, in May 1902, he who is now your president, said on organization these words as to representation nobody can represent anybody except himself all should be the lord's representatives but nobody can represent some other person or a church a church is fully represented in a conference when all its members are present but nobody can delegate his mind or his conscience to another if a person is present at any meeting Meeting, he does not require somebody to speak for him. And Jones says, that is the truth. It is a splendid statement of fundamental Christian principle. 
And in May 1902, that was stated by him in council as the principle of organization of 1901. And then, and that that is the truth. It is the principle of 1901. And in the presence of that principle, the present system of 1903 cannot stand for a moment. So what's going to happen in 1903 is when the church is going to reorganize, right? So that's what he's saying is 1901, there's this organizational principle that Ellen White says we need to be reorganized. In 1902, it's stated by the one who's the conference president, the truth. And then he's going to say that in 1903, they don't follow that. Are you 328 delegates now assembled and sitting here on the principle that nobody can represent some other person or a church? This great assembly of, of the people present at every session of the conference are these all proceeding on the principle that if a person is present at any meeting, meeting, he does not require somebody else to speak for him? Is this conference or any other conference of Seventh-day Adventists conducted in any sense on that principle? On the open face of things, prima facie, the present system is the direct reverse of that principle of 1901. Now, your president equally with all other men, has full and perfect right to change his mind and reverse his principles whenever he chooses. But when he has changed his mind and reversed his principles, then he has no right to insist that the reversal of principles is the direct and consistent continuation of the original principle. Such a course is the utter confusion of all principle, and for any person to insist on its correctness is only the demonstration that he has lost all use of the faculty of direction. Now, just dealing with this idea of principle and uh, policy. So when we were at the School of the Prophets in 2018, and we were, Heidi and I, having difficulty trying to communicate to uh, the leadership there that they, they, that they thought we were causing problems of some sort that they couldn't, they didn't want to talk about. They weren't going to tell us what these problems were specifically. They just told us what we had to do. So we had no part in the discussion of anything that we had to do. They were to tell us what we had to do. And we were fine, just as long as we were told and given the opportunity to do that. But every time we tried to do what they asked us to do, they kept changing. And and what they would say is that we uh, we have these policies that we are trying to use to stop problems occurring in the movement. Now, it was pointed out to them what Ellen White says about policy in principle. And so then they just des- decided that the word principle meant the same as the word policy. So instead of talking about policy, they started talking about principle. But really what they were doing was just calling policy principle. So it was it was rather interesting. And one time, you know, Bronwyn sort of flubbed up and she said, I can't remember exactly how it happened, but. I think maybe she said principle and uh, Jason said, you mean policy? And and she kind of looked at him funny. But uh, the problem here is that people can act as if they're doing something. They can give lip service to doing something. But the reality is to actually do it is quite a different thing. It requires faith and trust in God. Okay, so he's going to go on here. He says, also in that report, the impression is conveyed the chief fault which made necessary the reorganization that had be, was begun in 1900 was the particular size of the circle of administration. The circle was too small. And this is also incorrect. The size of the circle was not at all the chief feature. It was that it was in the circle. The word that was given is that in that circle, a king is enthroned. Where is a king enthroned? Whether the circle contains 500 or only five, the principle is the same. The word then is given, the Lord wants the Holy Ghost to be king. And that is what he wants now and always and forever. Will you let the Lord have what he wants? Will you let the Holy Ghost be king? On the principle of 1901, as stated by him who is now your president, the Holy Ghost could easily be king. But the system of 1903 and now of representation and delegation carries in itself the whole principle of papal infallibility. And on that principle, there is never any place nor any chance for the Holy Ghost to be king. 
And that is all that I ask anywhere, simply that the Holy Ghost shall be allowed to be king. And that is now the one great issue of the third angel's message. For here stands the great and mighty movement of federation of churches and religion of and for all the world, passing itself off as the kingdom of God. And the only way that it can truly be is with the true kingdom of God. That movement of church federation is only the kingdom of man in the place of God. And Sunday observance is the sign and badge of it, while the Sabbath of the Lord is the sign and badge of the kingdom of God in his own place as God. The true kingdom of God, or the false kingdom of God, that is now the one chief issue of the third angel's message. The true kingdom of God is God in his own place as God, all in all. The false kingdom of God, a federation of churches and religion, is man in the place of God, showing himself that he is God. The Sabbath of the Lord is the sign of the kingdom of God, and of God as true king in that true kingdom of God. Sunday observance is the sign of the false kingdom of God and of man as false king in the place of God. And everybody who does not know and have God to be his king in the true kingdom of God will compromise and will observe Sunday to satisfy the law and authority of man. In other words, everybody who recognizes man in the place of God anywhere will receive the sign of man in the place of God and will wear that sign either in his forehead or in his hand. Now, this this is an important paragraph here. So Jones in talking about the mark of the beast and the seal of God is that this is not something that is just an intellectual recognition. People, if you're a Seventh-day Adventist and you believe Saturday is the Sabbath, that you have then received the seal of God. It's going to result in your character. And those who have a false idea of the kingdom of God that use authority to control others, and instead of allowing God and trusting in God to work in the life of individuals, feel that we need to some way control the work because, you know, we have this responsibility and we have to protect people from these false ideas and so forth. We will, in the end, receive the sign of man in the place of God instead of the seal of God. And so the issue about Sunday Sabbath really is something that is manifest because of our characters, not because of some intellectual understanding about which day is the Sabbath. Jones goes on, he says, this is now the great central issue, the fast hastening final issue of the third angel's message and the whole world. Who shall be king, God or man in the place of God? Which kingdom and which sign will you have? You can't have both. I know that with an air of horror, it is exclaimed, why, according to what you advocate, the whole thing would be only a rope of sand. I answer, no. In all that I have advocated, the Holy Spirit is soul, sovereign, king, guide, and all in all. And when that is allowed to be so, then by the mighty energy of that divine spirit, the sand is molten into the sea of glass, reflecting the image and glory of God. And upon which stand the ransom of the Lord, singing in triumph the song of redemption. Without the Holy Spirit, human nature and all combinations of human nature in the church ought to be only a rope of sand. God forbid that it should ever be a rope of hemp or of American steel to bind God's people in bands and fetters and yokes. I repeat, in 1901, the denomination was brought to the very threshold of the Christian and New Testament order. But instead of going on through the open door, fully into evangelical Christianity. In 1902, the whole order was reversed. In 1903, this reversal was confirmed in general conference. And now, as officially written and published, the denomination is openly and positively committed professedly to the Mosaic order, but in fact, to the first steps of the papal order. Now, I want to make some comments about uh, what happened in 2018. I'm trying to think exactly how that worked so we had some discussions when i was there at the school of the prophets and heidi we we had discussions about organization now uh parminder wasn't there jeff wasn't there 
uh, it was Tyler who was leading out. And I'm pretty sure it was it was then not in 2017. I'm pretty sure it was in 2018. And I, I made a number of statements. I read a number of statements from the Spirit of Prophecy about organization. I read some of Joan's statements regarding organization. And there seemed to be an agreement with everyone there with these principles that Jones is laying down. But um, when Parminder got there and he began leading out, he he basically rejected everything that we had discussed. So, so I knew there was some problems there uh, regarding what they considered to be organization, that they wanted to have more control. But sometimes uh, Parminder would give lip service to things but not actually do them. And an example of this, when we got there in 2018 and uh, the first presentations that uh, Parminder presented, he talked about how our, our, our class, the morning class and the other classes weren't like they used to be where we would just kind of study together. Now they're more like lectures and, and um, there wasn't as much participation. But yet he was the worst at that. When he was presenting, I remember, and it might have been, maybe it was in 2017 when he, he talked like that, but I think it was 2018. Anyway, often when he was presenting, if I had a comment, he wouldn't let me speak. I know that in 2017, he, he, he would not let me speak on a lot of different points when he was presenting about the nature of man. And he, he told me, well, it's just because you already know all this stuff. You know, I know where you're going to go with it, but I have the direction I'm going with it. And so... You know, you'll see how it all fits in. Uh, but in reality, the things that I would have said would have disrupted what he was teaching. So you can't always go by what somebody says that they believe. You have to go by their actions. Now, when we look at Jones and we look at what is said about him by the church, the, the you know, the, the people who are there, uh, they're going to put Jones in a very bad light. You know, they're going to say that when he was leading out in conferences, he was he was dictatorial and, and all this type of stuff. I don't really give much credence to those type of evaluations of individuals, because when people are trying to do what is right, the easiest thing to do is just misrepresent their character as being the opposite of what it is. Right. So if somebody's very kind and patient if you present him to other people as impatient and unkind and unjust, people will listen to it and, and they will then interpret his actions or that, that person's actions in a way that it has been colored uh, by others, right? Now, everybody has defects in character. Everybody has things that you could twist or uh, misrepresent. And that's why it's very important that when you have conflicts that occur such as you know has happened in this movement that it doesn't become about the individuals it becomes about what is actually being taught and and mostly what you need to do is present the truth you, you try not to focus too much on correcting error as just presenting the truth doesn't mean that you don't use illustrations occasionally and reference things that you believe are to be error but it should never be personal about the person you know, about his character. It should always be about what's being said. And it needs to always be represented correctly, not in a way that's going to, you know, create a straw man argument. You want to have, you want to bring the person's strongest points and arguments and look at those. You don't want to pick at flex. Okay. Um, so anyway, just reading this here, uh, this next paragraph. In this same general conference of 1901 at Tacoma Park, Washington, D.C. on May 26th, in the 22nd meeting of the conference, the proceeding as officially published confirmed that all I have said here as this papistical tendency, as to this papistical, papistical tendency, the subject before the conference was resolutions 10 and 11, providing that a book editor be appointed by the General Conference Committee and warning the people against reading any literature that was not on it, that was not on it, the SDA denominational imprint. Okay, the minutes contain the following, which we'll read that there. Um, but this kind of reminds me of the, the 
uh, doctrinal analysis group that uh, uh, the movement put into place in 2018. I think it was in 2018 they set it up. They might have set it up in 2017. Uh, but this idea that we would have this analysis group anal- analyzing the doctrines of papers. Now, if it was like an editorial group, which here it talks about a book editor, I mean, that, that might have been a bit more accept, acceptable. Like if somebody has submitted a, an article, maybe people could make suggestions about it. But it really was a doctrinal analysis group. And and in a sense, that's what was being set up there as well under the idea of a book editor and that people shouldn't read literature that has not the SDA denominational imprint. Right. So he, he's going to go on here. Uh, D.W. Farnsworth is state making the statement. How extensive would be the power of the book editor? Would he simply attend to the grammatical errors and the style, or would he make practically a new book of it? Uh, Willie White says, I understand that a servant is to do that which he is instructed and employed to do, and if he does not do it satisfactorily, his employer gives him proper instruction. This man who would be employed by the General Conference would work under the direction of the General Conference Committee principally through the publishing department, and he would naturally do those things which he was asked to do, and his work would be submitted to the members who direct his labor for approval. It would be impossible for this congregation to instruct a book editor as to how far he should go in literary criticism or in criticism of theology, but the members who stand close to him would need to give him instruction, and his work would be, I understand, advisory, and would be directed by the General Conference Committee. Well, that kind of seems like a pretty political answer. But anyway, and, and uh, W.C. White, when White goes on, he says, isn't it time that we say to our people that the imprint of one of our houses it means something? The imprint of one of our school printing houses means something. The imprint of one of our conferences means something. In our yearbook, there are 22 publishing houses recognized. Should not our people take time to look to the yearbook and see what that imprint is? Otherwise, how are we to carry into this publishing work the same principles that we stand for in the doctrine of the laying of on hands as it applies to church officers, to conference officers, to teachers in our schools? It is that sort of work that this resolution is aimed at, and I'm sure that your sympathies are with it. It is intended to instruct our people to watch the imprint of the literature which they receive, and to have some test as to whether it is Seventh-day Adventist literature or not before they eat it or begin to pass it out for other people to eat. Uh, so Jones comments on this. It doesn't need a lot of comment, but I could myself characterize the foregoing and show just what it is like. But this has been so well done by the Review and Herald itself that I will only quote what that paper says. Just one week following the day when the foregoing statements were made in general conference. In the Review and Herald of June 3, 1909, on the first editorial uh, page, there is the following editorial article entitled, Subjugating the Mind. The conquest of the human mind has been one of the prime objects of man's en- enemy during the entire campaign of unrighteousness. There have been many methods employed in bringing it about, but one object runs through them all. To subjugate the mind is to conquer the individual who possesses it. Lucifer has had that in view in the inauguration of every system of false worship, as well as in some other movements, not rated as religious. In hypnotism or mesmerism, the operator can do nothing until the subject yields his intellect to the control of another. In spiritualism, the spirits can do nothing until the medium is in a receptive mood. In Christian science, in the Emmanuel movement, the same campaign against the consciousness of self is waged while the subliminal self or some other being self is set over the thoughts and actions of the individual. In the same category stands the Roman church, anathematizing private opinion and liberty of conscience and seeking to compel men to think and speak only as uh, the church dictates, or as Dr. Oral O.R. Brownson in the preface to his great defense of the Catholic church essays and reviews, Preface page six says, the articles which comprise the book before being printed in the quarterly review were submitted to the revision of a competent theologian. And I have no reason to suppose that they contain anything 
not in accordance with Catholic faith and morals. But they are, as a matter of course, republished with submission to the proper authority, and I shall be most happy to correct any error of any sort they may contain the moment it is brought authoritatively to my notice. It is not my province to teach. All that I am free to do is to reproduce with scrupulous fidelity what I am taught. This is the position that must be taken by every loyal, loyal Catholic writer. Otherwise, his book is placed upon the index expurgatorius, and he is anathematized if he persists in holding his opinion. Every book that bears the imprimatur of an archbishop stands for an individual whose mind is subjected to the dominance of some authority outside himself. And every time such dominance is permitted, God is robbed of the allegiance that is his due when the whole world bows down to one earthly ruler although he is arrayed in the insignia of the vice regent of christ it will have declared its intellectual and religious capitulation to the powers of darkness and the time for the son of righteousness to shine forth in the glory of the father will have come Jones says, I do not know that this editorial in the Review and Herald of June 3rd was aimed at that papalistic procedure of the General Conference one week before. I hope that it was. But whether it was or not, it is certainly could have hit straight, could not have hit straighter that procedure in General Conference if it had been positively aimed at or positively aimed at it. For what can be the difference in principle or in practice between the imprimatur of the Catholic Archbishop and the imprint of a Seventh-day Adventist publishing house or conference. And this imprint can come only from the general conference through its editors, who, as a servant, is to do only that which he is instructed and employed to do by the general conference committee or the members who stand close to him to give him instruction. What can be the difference in principle, in practice, or in consequences between the people of the Catholic Church being instructed to watch the imprimatur of the literature which they receive and have this test as to whether it is Catholic literature or not before they, they eat it or begin to pass it out for other people to eat. What can be the difference between that and this instruction to Seventh-day Adventists to watch the imprint of literature which they receive and have this test as to whether it is Seventh-day Adventist literature or not before they eat it or begin to pass it out for other people to eat. Now, um, this reminds me of something that, uh, like what we read there, what the Catholic uh, Archbishop or whoever it was that wrote that said. Um, uh, Parminder said something very similar. Now, this was uh, in answer to uh, questions. It was a question and answer session that they had after August 9th. So I can't remember the date of it. But I have it recorded here in the document called The Rebellion at Baal Peor. And I'll just read to you what uh, Jones, not Jones, Parminder said. So I'll open up the document here. Was this Parminder's response to Baal Peor? No. This is just, um, this is just what he said in a question and answer video. So, um, so I talk about the, the it's called uh, Fragen and Antworten, Questions and Answers. That's the name of the video. And so here's what he says in this video. Praying is not enough. You need to go to someone who will teach you. Then it, the question says, should we just submit to everything the leaders of the movement say? Until you learn to use the rules, it is probably a wise decision because your other option is to submit to nothing that the leaders of the movement say, which of course is not true, right? It, it, it's not a, that's, that's what we call a false dichotomy, <laughs> right? So, I mean, to say that I have to submit to everything the leaders say, the only option is to listen to everything, submit to everything the leaders say or nothing at all, um, that doesn't make sense. Anyway, if you frame the question that you have to accept everything, submit to everything, the opposite is to submit to nothing, which, of course, is not true. And, and you don't need to look at the opposite. Anyway, if you are going to say that you accept some things and not others, on what basis would you accept or reject things? 
He says it can't be upon conviction because conviction is based upon rules and principles. Well, of course, that's not true either. But almost nothing Parminder says is true. So you are just going through circular arguments. And actually, Parminder is the one doing the circular argument. He says, I suggest we pray to learn how to use rules. Faith and works go together. Go to a decent school. Be instructed by good teachers. You will learn to use the rules. When you do that, you will intelligently submit to everything the leaders of the movement say. So isn't that very Catholic? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, it just reminded me of that. So I thought I would take a look at that statement of Parminder's. So, uh, so Parminder's movement was wanting us to be Catholic, really. And of course, the Seventh day Adventist Church want, wanted its members to be protected from false doctrine. I'm, I'm not really sure why somebody would care, you know, who wrote the book. It, it, no book has an authority over God's word, right? Just because it's in a book that the Seventh-day Adventist Church put out doesn't mean it's correct. It obviously will represent what, what the organization wants you to believe, but it doesn't mean that it's true. And there's no reason that, that I should just believe it's true because the church has put out the literature. Okay, what is the difference between the position and the condition, too, a Catholic writer whose province is only to reproduce what he is taught by his ecclesiastical superiors. What is the difference between that man and this proposed general conference editor who is expected to be a servant to do that which he is instructed by the general conference committee to do and whose work should be submitted to the members who directed his labor for approval? And note, it would be impossible for this congregation to instruct a book editor as to how far he should go in literary criticism or in criticism of theology, but the members who stand close to him would need to give him instruction. Yes, of course. It would be impossible for you to do anything of that kind, but we, lo, we the superior few, who stand close to him, we can do all this in perfection. A little bit sarcastic there, but anyway, it's it, it's kind of bizarre if you think about it. I shall not follow analysis further. I will only say that never in all the Middle Ages was there a more papalistic thing proposed than this that was put through by the Seventh-day Adventist General Conference on May 26, 1909. Read the full proceedings on page 173 to 175, General Conference Bulletin, and then read many times again the editorial here quoted from the Review and Herald, June 3rd, 1909. And will the Seventh-day Adventist people submit to this subjugating and enslaving thing as the Catholic people do? Will they? Will you? The Seventh-day Adventist officialdom will, of course, just as the Catholic officialdom does. Uh, for it was they who put this thing through. And indeed, they have already submitted to it. For all of the 328 delegates in the whole discussion covering large pages, there was not a single dissenting vote. They have done it. Now, will the people submit to it? A servant is to do that which he is instructed and employed to do. Yes, he is. But whose servant is he? Every Christian is to be the servant of Christ, to do that which he is instructed and employed by Christ to do. And Christ has spoken it. Be not ye the servants of men, whose servants are you? Servant are you. By this action of the general conference in session, every Seventh-day Adventist is definitely put upon the issue to decide it for himself, decide it himself for himself. Whose servant is he? Is he the servant of Christ to do what he is instructed and employed by Christ to do? Or is he the servant of men to do what he's instructed and employed to do by some committee or some specially superior few who stand close to him to give him instruction? Now, the one thing I want to say about this, too, um, because a lot of this has to do not so much with doctrine, but just with controlling the work. But even in the area of doctrine, if somebody is teaching error, there is a way in which we are to act. Ellen White lays it out, right? We don't use the authority of the church or of a few people or a conference to decide what doctrine is. And if if somebody is teaching error, 
uh, we can easily labor for that person to correct him if we are correct in our view. Um, this idea that everything has to be, and one, one doctrine I look at within the Adventist church, obviously that's very controversial, is the doctrine of the Godhead or the Trinity or whatever you want to call it. The, the, the controversy that existing over how to understand God. And I believe actually the church is responsible for the situation that now exists uh, within Adventism in how, how they have tried to address the issue. We had this personally in Werber Church where we had uh, the head elder uh, read some things that some people objected to. And he was reading something he wasn't even, he was just kind of looking into the issue of of the Godhead and reading some things. And I don't know if he fully understood everything he read, but some people felt that that was leaning towards the idea of attacking, you know, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit as all being God. Um, actually, the document really wasn't doing that. I don't think it, it did that. But it was looking into the topic. And the way that the church and the pastor especially treated the head elder led to the head elder going into a more extreme view on what, what I call anti-Trinitarian. And that his is just, you know, typical of what's happened with so many other people on other kinds of issues. That when you, instead of taking the time to study with somebody as an individual, you call them out, you present them as a heretic, uh, you're going to drive them further from the truth. So if somebody is teaching error, you have to be patient. I mean, maybe it's not error. Maybe our understanding is is faulty. Or maybe it's just that it's something that no one can really agree upon because we are all so different. I, I personally don't believe that we can understand uh, the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, and the Son. And people argue about these things all the time. And I've been an Adventist for a long time. I, I accept what I was taught when I became an Adventist which is I don't believe in the Catholic Trinity, but I do believe the three persons of the Godhead. But, uh, you know, how to understand that? I don't I don't believe that I fully understand it. But I don't think it should be an issue. People shouldn't be disfellowshipped because they can't express themselves clearly. And the pastor, in doing presentations on it, contradicted himself constantly. That is, he didn't understand it himself. So... You know, it, it is just something that, um, you know, when it comes to understanding truth, it's something that takes time for every one of us. We all don't understand truth. All of us have problems in understanding truth correctly. So I don't know how a group of men can decide when somebody's teaching truth or error unless it directly contradicts something that we would recognize, that everyone would recognize is error, not something that's disputable. Anyway, so he says, or is he the servant of men to do what he is instructed and employed to do by some committee or some specially superior few who stand close to him to give him instruction? Also, by this general conference action, every Seventh-day Adventist is brought to the issue to decide it himself for himself. What is the test of truth? It is the spirit of truth who is given to guide you into all truth. Is it the spirit of truth who is given to guide you into all truth? Or is it a certain imprint fixed by men? And that's where we need to depend upon the Holy Spirit to convict the individual. And in view of this double issue, let there be wrung out everywhere clear and distinct divine word. Ye are brought, bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. In the general conference of 1903, I said in this connection that through, though Israel several times started back to Egypt, we never got there. But now it must be said that if this professedly mosaic but truly papal system shall be confirmed by this general conference, then you will have got there. You will be back to Egypt and the bands and fetters and yokes that have put, been put upon God's people will be confirmed instead of broken. And as certainly as this shall be, then there will go forth again from God the mighty word, let my people go that they may serve me. Is this general conference now going to confirm that? Nay, will not this general conference in every Seventh-day Adventist in the world espouse Christ and the Christian order only and forever? Okay, so <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to leave there. So we're going to pick up next week. It is not 
Protestant in truth. That's the next section. Now, we, did, we haven't had much discussion about this. So what do people think about what Jones has said? I mean, I can say I agree with Jones in what he's saying. I, I believe that the individual needs to be connected to Christ. And that is how Christ controls his church. But do we think he's going too far in his approach and how he's basically challenging the church? Or, or would you do the same thing? Any comments on that? Nobody has any thoughts? What's what's that? Yeah, you're kind of breaking up a bit. You definitely brought up the state of the conference then. Yeah, and, and and I think you know the church is in a worse shape than that today. I mean, yeah. the, the church has no idea of the foundational truths of Adventism, and now we can say, well, maybe the church is free in the sense that there are many people in the denomination, pastors, who don't believe in the twenty-three hundred days, or seventy weeks, or any of our time prophecies. Uh, they definitely don't believe in overcoming sin or the final generation reflecting Christ's character. And, and many of them don't even really understand um, Adventist history. That is, they just see it as a history of failure, right? In the sense that, well, you know, they, they were a bunch of legalists and they had a lot of problems and they, you know, we shouldn't go back to Adventist history and look at what was taught in the past because they didn't, they didn't accomplish the work and we're much more progressive now than they were. They were just a bunch of ignorant farmers and, and, um, uh, you know, kind of rubes or whatever. So, but we're much more cultured now, right? Much more sophisticated in our understanding. And we know that that's what Ellen White said would happen. There would be this, uh, books of a new order, a system of intellectual philosophy. And that's what exists within the church today. Now, in reaction to that, we can have things that are, are are just bad, right? We can have people who believe that, you know, if if somebody is um, educated, that totally unfits them to be presenting truth. That is, uh, you know, so if, if somebody knows how to read Hebrew and Greek, that's bad. You know, he's 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 spoiled in some way. And I've had people attack me on that. In, in that regard, they say, well, you know, you know, Hebrew and Greek. So, um, you know, you're educated. Now, I may be educated a little bit, not that educated, but I am educated, but I'm more self-educated. I understood when I went to university that what they were teaching was not to be just accepted. So I didn't I didn't submit to any education. And and I challenged ideas all the time. Because I, I I didn't I didn't go to university to become a theologian. I went to university to teach music. Just I took a lot of theology and writing courses because I wanted to be better at presenting things. But you know, so there are people who think that, and, and they're not disciplined in their study. They don't really understand much about God's word. They have never been students of Scripture, in the truest sense, and they think that they can bully you um, into accepting their views. A lot of a lot of times on social media, people who don't know what they're talking about because they have never really studied, uh, they just they use a lot of bullying language. And and we see this with well, you can see it on some of the recent videos where people are uh, you know condemning us Seventh day Adventists and making statements about spirit of prophecy and so forth not really understanding what they're talking about. They don't they don't know much about Seventh day Adventists, just things that they've read about Adventists. You know, they keep saying you make you know, you're you're saying that Satan is your savior because he bears your sins, things like that. And and that's obviously not a fair way to address somebody who's who you believe to be teaching error. You know, mockery and so forth is not is is obviously not good but people can think that they know more than they do right so a person who who has not really spent the time to study can have opinions about all kinds of things uh, the more that you study god's word the more you be, become dependent upon god 
to understand his word and also to share it with others. You don't, you, you become less self-confident, but more confident in the truths in God's word. And that allows you to communicate with people in a way that you don't have to be defensive. You're not insecure. And, and you can just try to present the truth to them as patiently as you can. So anyway, any other comments before we close with prayer? Okay, well, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the Sabbath, and for all the blessings that you have given us. Uh, we just pray that this Sabbath, uh, the studies tomorrow will be a blessing and that um, we can be drawn close to you and to each other. We pray for the health of each each person who's in these studies. We know that there's many trials that we face. We ask, Lord, for your angel care and protection. Help us to have a confidence and trust in you in what you are doing in the lives of others. Help us not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought, but to see our need and dependency upon you. And we pray that we can minister to those who are in darkness and that we can respond to the light that you have shone upon our darkened hearts. Forgive us for our sins and help us to continue to follow and serve you. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.